Hello everyone and I hope you're all doing very well. Today we have the pleasure of doing the review or the buyer's guide for the F14B module in DCS World. So the first and very important thing to state is that we are reviewing this module in its early stages, in early access. It was released in 2019, in March I think it was, it's now October 2019, so now five months old. And we're just going to judge it exactly as it is now. We're not going to anticipate any future changes. When the future changes come and when it's finished in a year, two years, three years, however long it takes, we'll redo this video then in its final form. So that's just one thing to bear in mind. Now to do this video, we're going to stick to the uniform structure that we've been doing. So this keeps it comparable to all of the other module buyer's guides that we've been doing. Namely, one, capability. We're going to look at the weapons, the sensors and the nav. Now this is a massively complex aircraft and we're not going to get too far into the nitty gritty. We're just going to stick to the main features. Two, kinetic performance. This may interest people who want to buy an aircraft with a certain performance, a speed, climb rate, whatever. So we're going to compare it against all of the other aircraft in various studies that I've done. Three, visual effects. How good are the graphics inside the cockpit and outside of the aircraft? We're going to rate that one to five. And this allows us to compare it to other modules, roughly speaking, empirically. If you wanted to rate it against other aircraft, then in the video description, you'll see a link to our database where we'll have all of the ratings for all of the aircraft from me and as well from the other guys in GR. So you can see not just my rating, but the other guys. Four, sound effects. How good is the sound engine inside the aircraft? How good is the sound engine exterior of the aircraft? Again, we'll rate it one to five. Five, interactivity in detail. How interactive is the cockpit of the aircraft? How many switches can we turn? What kind of noises do they make? How much detail is there behind those switches? How many subsystems are modeled of these switches? And so on. Again, rated one to five. Six, flight model. Not necessarily how well does it fly or how realistically does it fly compared to a real life F-14 because the fact is no one that plays DSA, DCS or hardly anyone will ever have flown in their 14. What's more important is that to us, well obviously it is important that it's realistic, you know, that's just taken as a default position, but what's important is that it's immersive, that it makes us feel we're in a real F-14. It doesn't feel too light, it doesn't feel too heavy, it doesn't feel too fast, too slow, too rolls too quickly or too slowly. We've spent this money, we want us to make it feel like we're in a real F-14B. We want to make sure there's no bugs, glitches, things there that take our immersion and make it feel like a video game. Seven, difficulty. Just a general rating between one and five. One being easy, five being hard and needing lots of study. How difficult is this module to learn and fly? One or five is neither good nor bad. It's just letting you guys know what you're going to spend your money on. Eight, history. Not too relevant in this case because it's an early access and um, only a few months old, but generally this is one we do to look at how the history, how reliable the module's been. Has it been buggy? Has it been glitchy when changes have happened? Or has it had very few problems? Okay, with that in mind, let's go jump in the cockpit. We're in the cockpit now. So a little bit of history. The F-14 was first created in its initial concept as a fleet defense weapon. It was designed to take off from aircraft carriers. It was designed to launch long range, medium range and short range missiles at other targets that are threatening the naval fleet. After a few years of service it became harder to justify its very expensive existence just being a fleet defender and it had to be beefed up in its capability. It had to have ground attack added and so we see with the F-14B version we've got here a pretty decent array of ground attack as well as air defense. So if we jump into the inventory if we start on the outermost pylons, it's probably going to be easiest. We've got 1A and 8A, and we've got simple air-to-air close-range IR-guided missiles, the AIM-9 Sidewinder L version and Mike version. They are both all-aspect-seeking Sidewinders, the M being the latest and the best model it can carry. Contemporary with, for instance, the F-15C and the A-10C and others in DCS. As well as that, we have pods, mainly just smoke and the dummy sidewinder pod. Next, 1B and 8B, a little more ordnance we can carry. First of all, the AIM-7 Sparrow Mike variant. This is a semi-active radar homing missile. It's what we call a medium range missile. The range will vary depending on parameters, but roughly about 20 miles max. We've got the sidewinders we can have again. Or we've got the ultra long range AIM-54 Phoenix missile, which is what this aircraft was designed around. A bit like the way the A-10 was designed around the Gao-8 Gatling gun. Big, heavy, complex, expensive, but very capable weapon. 
we've got the A Mark 47, the A Mark 60, the A, sorry, the C Mark 47. We find generally the best is the Mark 60, but they all have pros and cons. These things can be used in short range, but they are mainly designed for long range. Up to about 130 miles is the longest range at time of launch I've ever achieved which is realistic. We've also got bombs here. We can carry two times Mark 20 cluster munition canisters. These are non-guided cluster munitions. Mark 81, 250, sorry, two times Mark 81, 250 pound bombs or Mark 82, 500 pound bombs or non-slick, i.e. retarded snake eye variant of the Mark 82 or Mark 82 Air, another type of retardation for the Mark 82 or three training bombs or one times 1,000 pound Mark 83 slick unguided all unguided or rockets we can have zuni launchers these are high caliber rockets four rockets per lao 10 launcher and we can have two launchers per pylon let's move in we're going to go to two these are under the engine nacelles so you can see and all we can have here is fuel tanks it is actually a very fuel efficient plane and if driven properly it can go for a bloody long way it has a very high range as we found out on my various tests I've done but if you start using the afterburner it's a massive gas guzzler it has really powerful but fuel inefficient engines when on high power so we've got extra two times extra 300 gal tanks under there jettisonable next pylon three we're going under the flat body now air to air the phoenixes as we said before one per each pylon they require special adapters as you probably know or an aim seven mic bombs three times training bombs or different types of laser guided bomb a 10 a 12 a 16 and a 24 they're different weights of laser guided bomb and we can have a targeting pod a lantern pod on this aircraft which allows us to find targets and laser or we can drop these on a third party laser a jtac or another lasing vehicle or we can have a pod with three times 1000 pound mark 83s training bombs four times mark 81 two slicks and retarded mark 82 snake eyes or air or one times canister well we've seen these on the other pylons but with the addition of the mark 84 which is a 2000 pound slick dumb bomb we've got missiles this is the adm 141a tal this is a decoy it's we fire them out over a targeted area and they will just fly along and glide unpowered and they are intelligent in that they will represent a host a if you like a friendly aircraft to us on hostile radars so hostiles tend to target it and shoot at it instead of targeting us very effective rockets same as before zunis very powerful very accurate rockets and i think we're going to see the same or very similar to pylons four five and six we'll just quickly go through it air to air same bombs almost the same with the addition of illumination bombs that we can carry here otherwise more or less the same set out five uh, and then they're mirrored from then on pretty much so as you can see there if you work that out you can carry i forget the total now it's like 18 or 22 bombs we can carry a lot of bombs this is a big heavy aircraft it can lift a lot and carry a massive amount of bombs especially unguided bombs we also have the mike 61 20 mil multi-barreled vulcan cannon in which which is uh, internal in the aircraft we can have high explosive incendiary armor piercing incendiary whoops armor piercing high explosive or training now let's talk about how we can actually deploy those weapons so for the gun, we can use it in pretty much three ways. You can use it just bore sighted, so we can just have a fixed crosshair if you like here. Or you can use it with a basic type of INS guidance where it will give basic computation based on the factors of us, but not the enemy. Or we could use it in a radar guided mode in which it will give full computation for ballistics by locking onto the hostile and using our all nine attack radar. For the sidewinders, we've got various modes. We can use it just as a bore sight where we move the ball sight of our aircraft along the two axis across an aircraft's heat source. It will give us a tone and we could fire or we could use a search type scene mode where it searches in a configuration until it finds a target around a certain area in the HUD. Or we could slave our seeker gimbal of our sidewinder IR detector to our radar, i.e. we could get a lock with our radar on a hostile, say up here, and then the seeker on the sidewinder will automatically slave to that point there and acquire a lock super good stuff and this was pretty much maybe not the very first but pretty much the first aircraft in the world to have this type of technology so again in terms of history if you're inter in aviation history like me this is absolutely essential when we see all of the previous decades of technology coming together to give this 
which is pretty much how it stayed ever since. For our radar guided missiles, our sparrows and our phoenixes, they are so well and highly modelled in this module that I just haven't got time to go through it. you just got to take my word. There's five or six different ways of firing the Phoenix. There's various ways of firing the Sparrow. But just very generally in layman's terms, we've got a big powerful organine radar in the front of the aircraft. After searching for targets, we can acquire an, what we call an SCT track on a target and we can fire our radar homing Sparrow to that target that way. And the Phoenix, we can acquire a radar track from a radar search of a target over a hundred miles away if necessary we can use different types of track and then we can fire our phoenix onto the target that way we can fire multiple phoenixes this aircraft was developed with a radar that could use a new type of track known as track while scan which is pretty much as it says on the tin that will allow us to fire up to six missiles at once simultaneously or pretty much simultaneously so we could have six missiles going up to six different targets and again, this stuff has transferred through to the F-15 and the F-18 and whatnot, F-16. So a real, real good piece of engineering. In terms of our ground weapons, we have decent, modern weapons control system, which gives us a CCIP, a CCRP, or a depressible pip of manual mode of drop firing rockets and dropping bombs. This is good accuracy. It's not as tailored. It's not as polished as the really new aircraft like the F-18 or the A-10, but it's 95% there, and it's modeled just as the real aircraft. It's a little bit more clunky than the real modern aircraft, but that's just because of this aircraft's time in history. We also have a targeting port. It's used from this guy back here, the Rio seat. It will be placed here, it's called the Lantern Pod, and we can use this display here to view and track targets. It's obviously not as good as the more modern Lightning Pod as used in the A-10C and the Harrier and whatnot, but it does the job and it is realistic to as it was in the 80s. And we can find ground targets and we can laze and we can drop precision munitions or we can laze targets and have other aircraft drop their laser guided bombs onto our laser. It's very good stuff. We've got a HUD up here. I mean, it's a pretty simple HUD compared to things you're gonna find on your F-18, on your F-15. It seems very big and clunky, but again, for the time when this was out, this was the top standard of HUD. It's not perfect, like I said, it's a bit clunky and it's missing a lot of things that we're used to in modern jets, but that's just how it is. It does the job. In terms of sensors, this thing is absolutely bristling with sensors. So we've got a modern, good RWR here. I believe it's, uh, yes, it's threat rated rather than signal strength rated. There's a warn us about hostile radar warning sources and missiles being fired at us. We've got one here and one in the rear seat and we have audio warnings based on that as well we have the organine radar at the front which is an absolute behemoth of the radar although it does have ground scanning ability it is primarily a long-range air-to-air -air radar it's controlled from the back seat here this is an aircraft that has obviously a front seat and a rear seat and it needs two entities to be able to drive this aircraft you do need to have a pilot and you do need to have a Rio you can't do without either now if you don't have two humans then the Rio or the pilot can be replaced by an AI jester or an AI guy in the front I forgot what his name is and we'll have a look at that later but the Rio controls the organine radar here is the actual radar control I've got full tutorials on this it's really interesting really thorough modeled incredibly well here is a more tactical awareness type display where we can see input from the radar here on a top-down tactical type of view as well as that we do have a data link where we can hook up to other aircraft and so we can share data on our tactical display or we can hook up to an AWACS or a carrier and again we can share data of the battlefield for hundreds of miles incredibly effective and again amazing for the technology of the time we have a jammer system we have an onboard ECM sorry we have, there it is that's pretty effective we have a full countermeasure suite that we've got plenty of control of here and minor control with the pilot Back to the pilot, I don't really consider it sensors, I suppose, but we've got AFCS, we've got various autopilots, we've got altitude hold pilots, we've got attitude control pilots, we've got autopilots that will land us on an aircraft carrier. We have a massive control of different autopilots that we can use, really amazing stuff. I think that's as deep as we'll go with the sensors for now. In terms of navigation, we have excellent navigation system. We have an INS-based system, mainly controlled from the rear here, 
it's a waypoint based system so we can set different points we can program them in either here in the pilot or in the mission editor however we want to do it as well as that we have TACAN tactical air navigation that can get us back to say a friendly airbase or an aircraft carrier uh, which we have here here and a similar unit with the pilot I should mention as well with the INS system if we do have problems with it we have three different backups I can't remember this exactly but we have INS AHRS or IMU so if one system goes down you can go to the next if that system goes down you can go to the next and so on and if it all goes down then you can go to TACAN and if TACAN goes down and my memory serves me correctly I think we also have radio based IADF automatic direction finding in this which would take us to a VOR or maybe an NDB which would be a radio transmitter at maybe not a carrier but at an airbase with the ability to view our navigation through this repeater here or a primary in here it will take us to waypoints and whatnot of course I mustn't forget to mention that this is a carrier capable aircraft and as far as physics and how in case I forget to mention on the flight model later on in terms of how it reacts and, and how it maneuvers around on the carrier everything is fine there's no problems generally speaking there's been problems with this in the past with other aircraft but it uh, works pretty fine links up to the catapult fine and its physics when landing is all pretty good I've never heard of any complaints about it takeoff procedures pretty awesome So that's as far as I want to go into the capabilities. Yes, I've only scratched the surface, but I could literally make a 10 hour video about this. So you just have to trust that I'm just kind of picking on the main things where I can. Next, we're gonna look at the graphics. We're gonna look, first of all, inside. First thing to note is that these mirrors do work. I've just got them turned, oh, there they go. Uh, I've got them turned off for the time being. So, I mean, graphics are a little bit subjective. Some people think they're good when another person will think they're bad. Best thing I'm gonna do is just look around at the various stuff and you can basically rate it yourself. To me, this is top of the top for DCS. This is five out of five, I already know. It's just so beautifully modeled. Interaction between the pilots is modeled, the heads bob about when they're looking for things. It really is top brass. A massive amount of work has gone into this. Textures, technically they, you know, they puzzle a bit when you go in, but all in all, all the textures are absolutely beautiful. You can see a lot of work was done. Someone here measuring all the, uh, sorting this out, wiring and cabling. But you can even see the paint strokes on this little thing here. Just the amount, it looks like a real screw. Compare this to some of the older modules, it really is night and day. In some ways, this almost looks better than looking at a real Tomcat with a real kind of. Um, well, 1080p camera, if you know what I mean. Shadows are beautiful. Detail has gone in down there. This, along with the Hornet, clearly the best visuals in DCS at the moment. Look at that panel. Those circuit breakers. Stick is beautiful. Look at that. Compare that to a saber or something. It really is night and day. You already, all of you already know very well that I'm going to rate this five out of five for graphics. But I just want to show and prove it to you. Again, I'm only in 1080p, so I can only show you 1080p. That's all my system allows. What it looks like in high graphics, high resolution, I don't know. Look at all that up back, back there, the model. I mean, obviously it comes with a cost. Uh, you put more than a few Tomcats together in a GR mission and the frame rates slow down, but you know, it's just, just that's the cost of progress at the end of the day, isn't it?
there. We'll have a quick look around the uh, co-pilot. So I'm aware your time is very valuable, but try not to use too much of it. Remember that you do have the timestamps in the video description that you can use to jump different sections. I mean, look at that. That's not photorealistic. What is? To be honest, when you're fighting in this thing, uh, you never really think about the graphics. As soon as you're busy in combat, it might as well be, you know, 16 color VGA. But for just when you're sitting here admiring it, and also thinking, where's my $70 gone? You know, that's where your $70 is gone, right? Whatever it costs nowadays. Look at that. That might as well be an enhanced photograph. Okay. Let's go and have a look outside, shall we? detail on the exterior of the cockpit is amazing compared to the other uh, aircraft possibly maybe not the Hornet but compared to just about everything else look at that amazing One more thing I forgot to mention, sensors. You've got a TV camera down here. This is used for visual identification of hostiles, kind of uh, at long range, you know, up to about 50 miles. There's another sensor that's worth mentioning. Look at the detail on those struts. Never seen anything like it. Someone had to go and model that. It's even got those Allison clips modeled, but crazy. That there is better than a real life video, isn't it? There's no doubt about it. Okay, back in the lovely quiet copy. I mean, there's no doubt about it. If I could go higher than five, I would, but that is perfection. That is the pinnacle of where DCS is. That's a clear, obvious a five out of five. Next, we're gonna to go to sounds, and I'm I'm pretty happy that this just isn't complete at the moment, especially with the exterior, but I, as promised, the only way to do this is to measure it exactly as it is now. So we're gonna do inside and outside. First, let's just do some static tests. Now, it's very important in inside, and a lot of, uh, or some of the modules get this wrong. I need to hear when this my engines are at certain spool levels i need to hear them spool up and i need to hear the afterburners and i need to know that a real pilot he can feel the afterburners kick him in the back we can't feel that we need a big thump 
tell us the art of are going, especially if we're in a dogfight, we're lifting, looking up at our lift vector like that. Let's listen to those engines spool. Couldn't be clearer, could it? I can hear exactly what RPM the engines are doing at all the time. It's really obvious when the other afterburners coming on. Is that realistic? No, not at all. There's no way the, this guy would hear those afterburners like that in here. But it's what we need as virtual pilots, just like the big, and they've got it right. As well as that, it's manly. It makes us feel, you know, a fighter pilot is going to be cool. It's not going to be a dweeb. And um, those big burny sounds, they sound great. And like I said, they've got that right on the Vigan, again, like the MiG-21. Maybe a bit too much on the MiG-21, but... It's not quite right outside at the moment. It does sound good. standalone like this it does sound good I hear it from a different position what you guys hear I hear it from when I'm on the runway with my camera and all of the different aircraft come by and the F-14 and the Vigan are the uh, sorry the F-14 the Vigan and the MiG-21 are the least impressive because the sounds just don't cut through like the sounds of the MiG-15 uh, sorry the F-15 flanker F-18 F-5 so for instance if I put an F-5 next to this and again, you guys may not worry about this type of thing, but I do. I have to compare these planes side by side. The F-5 will cut through a lot more, be a lot louder than this aircraft here. So that's just one thing there that gets me a bit. Now the actual quality of the sound, it does sound really good, doesn't it? It does sound pretty special. It'd be nice if the afterburner was a little more punchy uh, in the exterior sound, but otherwise, it's all good. Now we're going um, to gonna take off. I can remember how to drive this thing. I think I can. Flaps up. Off we go. Now it's very important that we have ground sounds, i.e. the ground rumble, and I think I can hear it already uh, because we can't feel the wheels touching the ground like a real pilot can. Yeah, you can hear it already, that's a clear ground sound, isn't it? Don't need flaps to take this thing off, there's bucket loads of lift. Good clunky sounds of that landing gear, really good stuff a lot of effort into it clearly next thing I want to hear is I want to hear wind noise I want to be able to know when I'm going fast not just by looking at my speedo I want to know a kind of bit like a real pilot can know by the amount of noise on the airframe so what I'm going to do is get those burners on let's get nice and fast see if we can hear wind noise it's a bit hard to hear about the engines I'll turn the engines off in a bit I think that's wind noise, can you hear that? A rushing sound. So it's telling me I'm doing 400 odd knots. It's going really fast. Not quite as exaggerated as I was like it. And let's uh, slow down again. So it's definitely a bit louder when we're going fast. But I personally would like it a bit more night and day. I'd like it 600 knots, like in the F-15. It gets really loud, or the flanker, it gets really loud. That helps me, um, helps me know how fast I'm going. Next, I want to listen to the effects of when I put the aircraft under stress. I want to look at the G, I want to look at the alpha, and I want the sound engine to tell me when I'm high, high doing high G. I want the sound engine to tell me when I'm doing high alpha, when the airfoil is starting to break down, when there's buffeting, and when there's stress on the airframe. It's important that the aircraft tell me this. Uh, a real aircraft pilot can feel it through his seat. I can't feel it, obviously, so I need the sound engine to tell me that. If it doesn't do that, then it's simply not complete. The after's burner so loud, I'm going to have to turn it off. See the alpha down the bottom, you can see the G. So we've got a good G effect there, you can hear the man struggling to breathe. Vapor trails. I really want to load the alpha up here. Oh ho ho, you can hear that. 
And that's a good and a bad thing. Uh, we'll talk about the alpha handling characteristics of this in a bit. But you hear when the alpha gets above about 15 degrees, you can really hear, hear it start to struggle. I'll try one more time. I'll try not to snap my wings off. You can hear it. You can hear it at 12, you can hear it at 13. And you can see the shaking as well. I know that's technically not sound, but it's all incorporated together. You hear it? You hear things shaking about, vibrating, all that stress in the airframe. That's there, it's good, it's solid. Exactly like I want it and need it to be. Uh, next thing we have to think about is ordnance. A real air for a real fighter pilot can feel when his bombs have dropped. He can feel when his sidewinders have shot and feel it through his seat. We can't. We need nice sounds and I didn't bring bombs up with me, I can assure you that the bombs make a nice thump. It's not loud, it's not too arcadey, but it's there. The uh, missiles make a nice uh, kind of thuddy sound when they come off. Again, that's what I need, I need to know that. Because otherwise I don't know when my missiles come off. Gun, uh, let's see if I can get the gun working, hang on. Pretty crap to be honest. <laughs> A bit of a disappointment really sounds a bit like an arcade doesn't it eh, eh. so anyway that's that so we can do a summary um i mean it's, it's all there like i said good crunchy sounds in the cockpit it gives me the feedback it gives me the alpha feedback it gives me the g feedback there is wind noise but not enough of my liking i'd like that wind noise to be a little bit exaggerated i want 600 700 knots to be deafeningly loud like the f-15 really tells me what i'm doing it gives me the warning i need to know not to suddenly pull up on the stick Weapon sounds are all there, the, the gun sounds a bit stupid and puny to be honest, but it's, you know, it's a relatively minor thing. Uh, in fact, sorry, one thing, oh yes, I haven't got to the main problem. Um, obviously this isn't finished, so you can't blame them, but watch this. See that? It pauses before the sound comes in. The sound is buggy outside, put it that way, the sound is just buggy outside, I'll try again now, watch this. No sound. And then suddenly the sound comes in, and when it come in, when it comes in, it's not dynamic enough. It should be quite, quite loud, 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 quite, quite, quite. It just stays as loud. Uh, it stays as loud coming in as it does outside, and it doesn't sound very good in my videos. You know, I'm uh, sound is half the thing when it comes to making videos. The visuals are, the, are just a half, and the F-14 sound shit basically outside. It sounds okay out here, but it's very quiet compared. I mean, I've got the sound turned right up to maximum, obviously. Out here, it sounds okay again, but. Compared to an F-15, it'll be much louder, or a flanker, or an F-18. So, oh! See, it worked that time, but some, if I try it again, it'll just stop working again. Watch this. See what I mean? It's just buggy. And I'm not having a go at them. Again, obviously, it's early, uh, whatever, it's early access, but I will rate it as it is now. So the sound external, a little too tame for me, because I have to compare them to the other aircraft. They don't punch through like the other aircraft. And obviously you've got bugs there, the, the, the flyby sounds don't work properly. And even if they did work properly, the dynamics aren't there, it's too loud, far on, it's not too, you know, there's no dynamic, it doesn't get louder and quieter as compared to the other planes. The other planes do that really well. When F-15 comes towards you, an F-18 is... Whereas this is just noise all the time. Um, so from a filmmaker's point of view, it's pretty cruddy to be honest. So because of that, we can't rate it top notch at the moment. We're going to have to rate that three and a half. It'll get fixed, and when it does, I'll update my. Um, I'll either completely remap this video, or I'll just update my scar score on the master uh, record, which is linked in the video description. So while we're in a cockpit, we may as well do the flight model, and this is this is really marmite. I think it's a it's a heat blur thing. They really like to exaggerate their flight models a bit, really sex it up, rock and roll it up a bit. Very different to a, to a ED slash Bell SimTech model where it's everything smooth, quiet, non-offensive, politically correct. These ones are just pure fire and brimstone. So the flight model on the ground regards interaction to the ground, top notch. I've never had a complaint by it, uh, about it. You can clearly tell when the aircraft has made contact with the ground or an aircraft carrier. It skids about if it's wet or you can even skid it in the dry. So all that stuff, top notch, no problem. When you do it in the air, your basic maneuvers, it's important that it feels like we are in a real aircraft. It's important that it doesn't feel like we're in a video game here. It feels like there's weight, it feels like there's momentum, it feels like there's inertia. And this thing, I mean, it's not the best, it's not the best in terms of this, 
And remember, there are stability systems getting away slightly in the way between me and this aircraft. But generally speaking, it, it feels like a big heavy bus. And that's what it is. It's a big heavy bus. It's not a nimble little fighter. It's 25 tonnes of aluminium and titanium that we're driving around here. And it does represent that. So I'm happy that it's got that. It's roll. It feels really good, actually. Oh, it's because I put my wings back. I thought that was a bit good. This roll is good. I mean, because it's a swept wing, uh, a sweepable wing, the roll and whatnot varies completely depending on your configuration, obviously. Climb and dive feel pretty top notch. The complaint there I'm going 600 knot IAS, uh, KIAS. And it comes, comes back to what I was saying. It, it's very easy to go fast in this aircraft and it not warn you because the sound engine is not giving me enough noise. It should be it should be wind noise like the F-15 and the flanker in here. It should be giving me a massive warning I'm going fast and then I wouldn't have pulled back so much there. Because to be honest, I thought I was going about 300 knots. And when I'm thinking about my speed, I don't really look at these instruments here. I do them by the flight model sound engine. So it's very important they give me that feedback. And it's simply not quite here in terms of speed in the F-14. And I would like to see that change. I'll never get my way because I never do. But it's just, you know, it's a thing. 600 knots to me should feel loud. It should be giving me warnings in terms of sound. Not to pull back on the stick too hard or something bad's going to happen. You see what I mean? So next we need to look at the uh, manoeuvrability, you know, using it in tight turns and whatnot, you know, dogfight scenarios. And there's a really incredibly important point I have to bring up, and this applies to the new F-16 that's been released as well. If we go to adjust controls, and we go to our axis commands, we go to our joystick roll and our joystick pitch, mainly our joystick pitch, but our joystick roll as well and I go to axis tune, most of you will be using curves on your various planes, and I do. I have a pretty much standard curve of 25 plus 25 on all of my aircraft. It just works well with my X56 Logitech through all of my aircraft. And the idea of adding a curve, if you don't know, is to add a bit more detail around the small elements of the movement and less detail around the large. However, something I've just learned recently is very important. Some aircraft simply don't work with these curves with certain joysticks. So with my X56 joystick, you cannot have a curve on the Tomcat. It completely ruins it, and I have no idea why this is. I've never figured it out, but some aircraft, the F16 and the Tomcat, simply you can't have a curve on it. It's almost impossible for me to explain why that is, because I don't really know, but you get in these weird scenarios, especially in the pitch, where you get what I call pitch pogo, where the, where the nose bounces up and down and up and down. It's something to do with the way the curve and your muscle memory is reacting with the aircraft so for me at least and a lot of you i know have had the same problem especially with the x56 stick you must be on zero or around zero i found it's optimal for the f14 and it is night and day that makes it for me and my setup an awesome aircraft to fly that makes it unflyable and this is actually the second version of this video i've done here the first i did it with a curve on and i hated it i said i hate the tomcat all i did was do that as you guys suggested, suddenly it's a great plane to fly. Really weird, I know, but that's just how it is. So I really wanted to put that point out there. And I've done the same with my roll as well. Okay, so let's get the burners on. Let's get turning. Now that I've got the curve from the sort out of my stick, it is, it's a real delight to fly. I've got bucket loads of feedback from what it's doing. I don't have any pitch kind of pogoing problems like I had before with the curve stick feels like I'm really pushing through the air here and it feels like I'm really connected to the plane. Roll and pitch. And one thing I used to complain about is that if, if, if I over Alfred then I'd have a lot of shaking in the cockpit. As you can see now. See that's a really heavy shake. That's the biggest shake out of any of the aircraft in DCS. Now I don't really have a problem with that anymore because I don't have a problem with the pitch anymore because of my joystick just like I showed there. So now that I've got good control over the pitch of the aircraft you very rarely get into the really big vibration like that. I'm doing it on purpose obviously. And some people complained about the um, big vibrations but it only really does it especially now in late October 
at the really high values of alpha, so you very rarely get into that. So it's something they've toned down in the last few months, and it's, uh, it's, it's good now, perfectly good now. Very similar to the Vigan, I think. So I'm really pushing what, 25 degrees alpha to, to get that big shake now. So as long as we're going to keep it within about 15 degrees to 20, which is going to be optimal anyway. It's perfectly stable. Just rolling with the wings out. Yeah, I love it nowadays. Uh, it's, it's completely different to when I had my stick set up wrong. It was, a, it was a horrible thing to fly. Now it's just an absolute joy to fly. As long as you're not really pulling that stick back hard, it's absolutely fine. Pretty easy to keep it within the limits nowadays as well. All in all, really happy with the flight model now. Problems have been worked out by Heat Blur and like myself, stuff that I was doing wrong on my side. I'll quickly try some really high G stuff ever so quickly. I definitely, I don't uh, usually advise a beginner for this. It's not a particularly beginner friendly flight model. So if you're you know new to simming it's not a plane that i would recommend in terms of flight model okay we've got some speed up put some g in there lovely progressive g lock really balance that on 9g or whatever i'm doing now i can't see 8g yeah Good. Right, so uh, it's not absolutely perfect, so I don't want to give it a five, but there's not much else I'd want to change on it nowadays, so I give it a solid 4.5 October 2019 for the flight model. Next comes interactivity and detail. This is only within the cockpit that I'm interested in. And being a heap learn module, you can already see where this is going. Um, it is beautifully interactive. It is beautifully detailed. Every button that I found in here, switch, works. As well as that, pressing these switches, it feels right, it feels solid. Time's gone into it. Effort's been made to make everything here feel right. I can feel the vibration of those buttons pressing, even though in reality, obviously, I can't. That's the whole idea, it's trying to fool me. Just like the Vigan, it reminds me of the Vigan. And just about everything in here that you're going to want to be, I'm not going to go through every button because this video will already be long enough as it is. Just about everything in here that you'll want to press is modeled and, you know, almost almost to the kind of uh, over the top amount of modeling. Uh, but it's, it's good, it's fine. It's, it's exactly how it should be. It's the absolute epitome. Oh, there's one that doesn't work, look. I haven't seen that one before. And these ones, look. That is rare. It's very rare. Lighting is very good in the cockpit. We had, it, it didn't even touch on that in the, in the graphics. Probably something I should have done for the other aircraft, but never mind. Going to the back, exactly the same. Beautiful model. Beautiful detail. Excellent amount of interactivity back here as well. Uh, all this IFF stuff model, even though we don't have. Uh, Highly model IFF in DCS, so it doesn't do anything. Here's some more stuff that's not there. It tests. It would be nice if you could move these switches, even if they don't do anything. I always appreciate the fact that my $70 has gone into moving these switches. None of this stuff's modeled, to be honest. I think that will be taking a bit to the extreme in this case of the F-14. So I don't think I'm going to rate it down for the circuit breakers. I will rate it down for these. Everything here works, everything here does something. You control this joystick with your actual physical joystick, you know. This is for the uh, TID. Detail that's gone into this radar is exceptional. So the manual is very good. 
Um, the manual is about, from memory, about 350 pages, something like that. Um, I mean, which is small, bearing in mind how complex this aircraft is. It does a good job. These guys are modeled, but it's not the airplane's fault. It's just because that stuff physically isn't modeled in DCS. Radio is modeled beautifully. Again, none of these uh, circuit breakers are. I won't rate it down for that. Again, it's taking a bit too, a bit too extreme if you can do all this stuff. Uh, if it's there, it's cool, it's a bonus. There's one that's not working. There's one that's not working. So, excluding these things, it's 98, 90%, 99% interactive. Feels solid when I interact it. Just about everything does something, it does the right thing behind the scenes. You read the manual, there's an awful lot going on behind the scenes that these various systems do. TID is very detailed as, you know, as far as it would be in the real aircraft. This uh, radar is very detailed, as said. You've got various uh, MFDs here. How do we get rid of that? Like that. You can see different things. You can see TACAN, you can see your INS destination, you can see your all-weather landing system, you can see your vector, you can see your manual mode, you can see this guy here, your TID repeater, you can see your ECM, which is uh, either not working or just not in this jet. Can't remember. Not there at the moment, anyway. TV, you can see a TV feed from the lantern. So all that's very good. Uh, now, it does break down a little bit in the 99% of people that are going to fly this plane are going to fly from the front cockpit and they're not going to have a human Rio in the back. If they have a human in the Rio in the back, great. Even more immersion. However, 99% of people just don't because they don't have a friend to go and sit in the back and that's completely fine. So instead what they have is an AI guy called AI Jester and you can communicate him through this system here. Now, this system here is pretty arcadey and stupid looking to be honest, but you know, what else can they do? They've got no choice. It's the only way we've got to really communicate with the pilot behind us. It's used, done by using your head tracking. I move, I bring the menu up. I want to tell him to do air to ground. I want to tell him to select a certain ordnance and then I'll press the rockets or something like that. And then he'll go off and do that. And the cool thing is he won't just magically do it in the background. He'll actually press those switches. So if you could go into the back here, you can actually see him pressing the armament switches for that particular weapon. Again, detail, just amazing. Like I said, this system looks stupid and I don't like doing it in my videos because it kind of gets rid of the viewer's uh, immersion. But again, I'm not, I can't mark it down for that. It's literally the only way that they could do a system like this. And that is, of course, the problem with multi-crew vehicles where, you, where both, where all of the occupants are actually needed. So unlike a training aircraft. So people say they want the Vulcan bomber, they want a, a Nimrod, they want a B1 bomber. Well, you'd have to literally control it all through or most of it through petals like this because all of those humans need to do their job and hence why we can never have multi um, multi-bomber crews and stuff like that dcs engine the detail of the dcs engine simply isn't suitable for that kind of vehicle so i just wanted to make you aware that that's how we control the vehicle if we don't have another human it's neither good nor bad it just is as it is so as a rating um you know what i know there's a couple of missing bits here but the rest of it is so good that I'm going to rate it interaction in detail 5 out of 5. If all this stuff gets fixed, then we'll jump over 5 or something like that. But even with the missing bits, it's 5 out of 5. It's just so good. Next is difficulty. And the problem with planes like the F-14 and the F-18C, F-A-18C in DCS is that they are... I don't want to say the problem, but these are the planes that are really getting a lot of people into DCS. The F-18 and the F-14 have brought swathes of people in they've seen their favorite jet in here and they thought yay let's go and play dcs now this has a problem as a lot of you guys tell me these are complicated aircraft to fly this 100 percent replicates the real f14b there's no shortcuts anywhere there's no easy mode you have to do exactly what the real pilot does and that's not an easy job and the problem is these sexy planes are attracting a lot of you in and some of you not all of you I'm just saying some of you are thinking it's going to be an easy ride, but you come in, you realize how difficult this actually is. You know, you've got to read a big three, four hundred page manual to really understand the systems that you're using and you get fed up and you go and do something else. And that's no disrespect to you. It's just, you know, I would be exactly the same. If it wasn't for Flaming Cut 3, I would never have gotten to DCS. And that's another reason why I'm doing this video. I'm going to tell you now it's not easy. If this is going to come in as your first module, if you, if you want to buy this as your first module, then God help you. You've got such a steep learning curve to learn. And it's not just how to control everything, you know. 
yes you can learn all of these buttons but as well as that and all of the detailed avionics and aerodynamics you have to learn in the background all the missiles and how the missiles actually work is a massive stepping stone as ever if you're not a seasoned simmer i always say go to flaming cliffs 3 first learn the background of aviation learn the background of how missiles work properly in an easy to use shell then come in here and have all your buttons and your systems and your subsystems and your subsystem systems and worry about that there that's something i want to mention not an easy plane in terms of just flying the thing like i've said it's not easy to be honest i struggle to fly it a lot of the time remembering all your procedures and whatnot and, and how to get your bombs on target and how to fire your missiles and how to lock everything it's hard to say because with two humans in it's difficult it is difficult being a rio it's not an easy job being a rio pilot is a bit easier if it's just you as a pilot which most of you are so that's how we're gonna rate it i guess and using the gesture system it's not too bad however like i said if you're not a seasoned simmer and you don't not uh, and you don't know a massive amount about, about aviation a lot of this stuff you just don't really understand this makes it look like an arcade game it's not when you're doing your bird beyond visual range when you're doing your stt lock what does an stt lock really mean when do i want to use an stt lock how will that affect me how will that make me more visible to hostiles how will it tell my hostile what i'm doing these are all things that you've got to know if you're going to start if you're going to fly well in a module like this so on uh, radar mode what do all these different radar modes actually mean this is a simplified version of it if you go in the back there there's about seven or eight versions what do these actually mean what are the benefits of that and that why would that be stronger than that in some cases and what does auto actually mean so really knowing when to use this stuff uh, certainly not easy again why i suggest an easier start because of that, as a pilot only, I'm going to rate that 4 out of 5. Definitely have to read the manual, watch the tutorials, do practice. Not to the extent of the A10C maybe, and there are much less controls than the A10C for instance, so we can't rate it at 5. But I'll definitely rate it at 4, not for beginners. And ever so quickly, I promised we'd look at the kinetic data, so you can compare it to other aircraft in the best conditions. Peak sustained turn rate at 50% gas, with an F18C at 420k task maintaining 22 degrees per second on the deck the f-14 really does hold its own it only does it at low speeds when the wings are out 300 to 330 k task and it can maintain 20 degrees per second actually very impressive that said that was five months ago i need to i know the model has revised so i do need to go and retest that but the chances are we'll get that it's got big wings that can dig in plenty of pitch authority powerful engines instant instantaneous achievable altitude We've got the F-14, the old model, could do 100,000 uh, feet. Obviously, that's been revised now. It can now do, where is it? There it is. It can now do 98,000 in an instantaneous altitude run. In terms of sustained altitude ceiling, in uh, ISA conditions, uh, we've got so we've no fuel, 67,000 feet, which we'll agree is pretty good and what we think is realistic. Got the old one here obviously that model is now superseded high altitude sustained and instantaneous speed it's there at 37,000 feet uh, sustained 1346 ktas mac 2.35 local and a max instantaneous in a dive 35,000 feet 1372 ktas mac 2.37 clean obviously uh isa conditions we're happy with that so it's pretty much in the middle of uh, the uh, the fast fighters low altitude speed really comes into its own here just a tiny bit slower than the ags 37 which is heavily ground configured obviously and with the wings back 866 ktas at 1.31 mac so that's telling you there if you're in trouble in an f-14b get down low and get fast and pretty much nothing's going to catch you up acceleration it starts to struggle a bit here it is a big heavy bird and we've got the low altitude acceleration 30 300 to 650 ktas and it's just down there in the middle just under 20 seconds surprising it's so slow really with the mirage much worse power to weight ratio being basically the same so i'm not sure why it's so slow but that is the modern flight model it used to be a bit better same test but angels 15 we've got it here uh, just above uh, average at 25 seconds if you're thinking that the f-15 and the mig-29 are really good just remember they are low fidelity models they are flaming Cliff cliffs models their flight models although pretty good are not as detailed and accurate as uh, the high fidelity models climb rate from a qra standstill of not bad bang in the middle one minute and five seconds 20,000 feet isa conditions 600 uh, up to from 600 knots up to 20,000 feet 
is where is it it is pretty good 20 uh, 26.88 that's the kinetic review next we're going to look at its history now it's not very old it's only five months old people have released it at a late stage in its development it was mostly finished when it came out now that's the way i prefer it that's much better in my mind than releasing it like the hornet about i don't know 30 percent complete and then slowly adding bits to it over a number of years i much prefer this system there have been a few bugs really early in terms of the stage it was released. There have been a few bugs. It's a massively complex aircraft compared to pretty much anything else in DCS. Maybe, I think it's even more complicated than the F-18. And things have gone wrong. Nothing what I'd say massive. They're all little annoying bugs and glitches. Nothing that would upset you for spending your $70 on it. A bit of interaction between the pilot and the, um, and the guy in the back. Uh, some sinking problems with that. Some loading problems with it. Of course, you've seen the sound problems. Generally speaking, it's been fine. Most people haven't been annoyed at, uh, at its development. It seems that they're working on it a lot, so things get fixed pretty quickly. So that's it. I know that was a big video, but it's a big plane to cover. It's a big, heavy, extremely complex vehicle. Very capable in the right hands, terrible in the wrong hands. It's not easy to use. To use properly takes a lot of skill, and like I said, definitely not a place to start. It's got what I would consider a few problems with the flight model. That may be me being biased. Maybe you guys disagree with me about that. I'd like to hear what you think. Just rushing back to the capabilities quickly. It obviously, as a long range fighter, shooting missiles out of 50, 60, 70 range. It was the only one in DCS in that case. So it's obviously very good at it. Just note that when it comes to medium and close range, it's actually pretty crap. I know the purists out there will be upset. The reality is, it is. Compared to a flanker, an F-15, a Hornet, a Mirage, when you get within 20 miles, this starts to become quite a bad plane. And if you do big team games like I do, it can actually be more dangerous to have an F-14 on your side within 20 miles because of the threat of IFF and things like that and shooting down your friends. Even with skilled pilots, we've seen lots of mistakes like that happen and those pilots would never make a mistake in another aircraft. So just be bearing in mind, if you think you're gonna take this out and you're gonna go dogfight against F-15s, F-18s and Mirages and stuff like that, you get, unless you're much better than them, you're going to get beaten. Simply not very good in close or medium to range. Am I, not, am I annoyed about that? I'm going to mark it down for that. No, not at all. That is how the real aeroplane is. It just doesn't have the tools that those more modern aeroplanes have. And because it's a two-plane jet at the end of the day, you need two extremely good humans to get the best out of this. Whereas a moderate player in an F-15C can fly extremely well because those challenges simply aren't there to him. That's it, I've given it the most unbiased and honest review that I could. I hope that helps some people out there. It is a really excellent play.